So Lord, you have really been pouring yourself out in these days. And we ask that tonight also there would be an especial grace, my God, in speaking and in hearing to communicate this particular burden that must find its way in the foundation and understanding of the church of the last days. Disabuse us of any sentimental notion or any human notion, my God, that is for or against Israel, but bring us into an alignment with your view and the significance of that nation, your dealings with it, its restoration in the last days. Show us our part, our privileged part. We thank you and give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. And take fatigue from your saints. Clear, my God, every uh, dulled mind and heart and spirit from just bodily fatigue and just the fatigue of much hearing and much speaking in these days. Thank you. My text is Joel, uh, I'm sorry, Amos. Chapter 9, the last chapter of the book of Amos. So you have Daniel and Hosea and uh, Joel and Amos that are called the minor prophets. But minor, not in the sense that they are insignificant or unimportant, but that the body of their writing is less than and smaller than the greater or the principal prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. But all the prophets are integrated and related in their understanding and in their revelation, though often they are separated by centuries from each other. They all dovetail and complete the remarkable tapestry of prophecy that speak of things not yet finished. I'm always astonished uh, at the church either handing out or carrying New Testaments only. The New Testament and the Psalms. As if the Old Testament is finished because it's old. Do you realize that there's more in the Old Testament that is yet to be fulfilled in the future than is included in the new? So don't think that the, the one book excludes the other. The new is hidden in the old, and the old is revealed and confirmed in the new. We need to open up the prophets again. And most Christians have only a very scant knowledge of these prophets. And I can't think of anything more on time for the church now than to study the prophets. So in this last chapter, chapter 9 of the book of uh, Amos, we're reading from verse 8. Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are on the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from the face of the earth. Nevertheless, I will not totally destroy the house of Jacob, declares the Lord. For behold, I am commanding, and I will shake the house of Israel among all nations. You can take your pen and underline the word all. That includes the Philippines. I will shake the house of Israel among all nations as grain is shaken in a sieve, but not a kernel will fall to the ground. All the sinners of my people will die by the sword. Those who say the calamity will not overtake or confront us. And in that day, I will raise up the fallen booth or tabernacle of David and wall up its breaches. I will also raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. 
Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman will overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows seed, when the mountains will drip sweet wine and all the hills will be dissolved. Also, I will restore the captivity of my people Israel, and they will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. And they will also plant vineyards and drink their wine and make gardens and eat their fruit. I will also plant them on their land, and they will not again be rooted out from their land, which I have given them, says the Lord your God. The reason I so much appreciate this single chapter is because it telescopes and brings together the whole scenario and drama of Israel in the last days. And it is a frightening and violent picture of a people again uprooted for a final time. If you can understand where I am coming from, I see present Israel established in 1948 politically as given for the purposes of God not to be established, but to be uprooted. How far will God go to perfect a nation whose restoration is critical to the conclusion of all his redemptive purposes in the earth? A nation that has brilliant promise and a millennial destiny and glory so great that God says elsewhere in the prophets, I will call you by another name. You will be called the ministers of the Lord. Nations will bring their riches to you. That nation that will not come up to you to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles will be cursed. That the Gentiles of ten nations will clutch the skirt of a Jew and say, Take us to your God, for you know him. That you will be a diadem in my hand, a, a golden ornament, a necklace, a, a thing of beauty, of enhancement, of honor and glory among all nations. None of these words describe Israel presently, but they describe God's restoration of a nation that he will allow to sink all the way down, that he might bring it all the way up and fit it for its millennial destiny and glory. Now, why this strategy of sifting Israel through all nations? Because God is not only sifting Israel, He is at the same time sifting the nations. We had a little talk this afternoon at the uh, university here, and my principal thought to the students was, don't think that God can be relegated to Friday, Saturday, or Sunday worship only. God is the God of nations. He's the God of creation, and he needs to be taken back again into the consideration of the conduct of men and of nations in the world, for he is the God of the nations. So God has a final strategy, and the object is not only to sift the nation Israel, but to sift nations through Israel. And if we read this text in conjunction with Matthew chapter 25, the very first judgment that the coming king and now reigning king will perform, who has established his throne in the restored city of Jerusalem and upon the holy hill of Zion, is to judge the Gentiles and the nations over one question only. What did you do for the least of these, my brethren? And those who are going to be cast into the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his angels will say, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or naked or in prison? And he will answer them, as you did not do this for the least of these, my brethren, you did not do it unto me. Isn't it remarkable that the final judgment of God for eternal damnation or eternal blessings for Gentile nations is over one final issue only. What did you do with the least of these, my brethren? That somehow there's a requirement to recognize in the least of these, his brethren, the, identify, the identification with himself. 
We're going to see a despised and hated people persecuted, uprooted, and fleeing through the nations in the avoidance of the anti-Semitic fury of such demonic proportions that it will eclipse the Holocaust of the Hitler time. I'm not expecting the majority of Jews to survive. But a remnant will, su will survive. But those, he says, who transgress against me, the sinners of my people will die by the sword. Those who say the calamity will not overtake or confront us. Now, this text brings together so many wonderful elements because the very next thing that we hear is, and I will restore the booth or the tabernacle of David which has fallen down. And my own interpretation of that is that that is a statement of the Davidic government of God. From the throne of David in the city of Zion, in the city of Jerusalem, in the restored nation of Israel. And this connects with so many scriptures, one or two of which I have been speaking now and again through the days that we have been together. Isaiah chapter 2 and Micah chapter 4 verse 1 says that in the latter days I will exalt this hill above all the mountains and all the hills. And the law of the Lord shall go forth out of Zion, and the word of the Lord out of Jerusalem. Now listen, you dear children. The issue of Israel's restoration is the issue of government. It's the rule of God over the nations through a restored nation. Israel has a theocratic destiny. God in his own wisdom has established that one nation of his choosing should be central to all nations and that the government of God should go out through this central eight, uh, nation not because it's great, not because it has some special distinctive being Jewish, because their historical record stinks, because they have blasphemed him in every nation where he has driven them but because he has chosen them and because the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. The issue of God and his calling, his promise, his covenant, his word is at stake with Israel's restoration. I want to say flat out, if God does not restore the nation Israel in the last days, he is not God. And it will be against every seeming impossibility. A nation that is about to be devastated by an enormous anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish fury poured out. Now you say, brother, why would people hate Jews like that? In countries where they don't even have a Jewish population that there will not be a nation where these Jews will not be safe. They will continually be in flight and be sifted in the process of flight to see who it is that God will restore or whom, whom he will allow to perish. Because the powers of darkness in their final hour who have but a short time in the earth want to annihilate that people whose restoration to God becomes the seat of God's true and authentic government over the nations and they don't want to give up their usurping influence and power. Can you see why I prayed for your minds? Uh, every sentence of this is like a thunderclap. Every sentence is weighty. Words like theocratic well, we know what democratic is. Demos means people. Cratic means government. The government of the people. What is theocratic? It's the government of God. And I want to ask you, in all honesty, 
Are you expecting that government? Are you expecting a king? Are you expecting his divine rule over the nations? Because it says in that day there will be a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. God will judge, it says, with equity and with justice all nations. You're not going to have your political hotshots and their conniving and scheming for their own advantage to line their pockets and have their great wealth. Like all of the shoes that Marco's wife had, she could have gone into business. And why not? They robbed the national treasury. The, the uh, president of Zaire, one of the poorest countries in Africa, where, they, where the poverty is unspeakably degrading, where I've seen people sleep on cardboard cartons on the sidewalk in the midst of their urine and their, their, their feces and droppings, lives like an unbelievable king that he is so wealthy his fortune is beyond counting. I've driven past one of his summer homes in Switzerland and I think, I think it took us about five minutes in the car just to go from one end to the other completely walled. How long do you think God is going to suffer this human impertinence of men enriching themselves at the expense of the labor and the life of entire peoples that they should live like great potentates as gods of this world while people live in the most abysmal poverty there's going to be justice in this world saints but not until God himself rules you know what we need to be sighing and saying Come, Lord Jesus. Now, we had a wonderful explanation today about the so-called rapture. If you weren't here to hear it, get the tape of this morning's question and answer session. I thought it was one of the finest statements that just put to death the whole heresy called rapture or pre-tribulational rapture that the church has conveniently lifted out before a time of global affliction comes. I hope to show you even tonight that if that were true, there would not be a Jew that would survive the time of Jacob's trouble. The only reason that a remnant survives this remarkable process of being sifted through the nations is that in each nation there are believers who will take them in. who will provide for them, who will see them naked and clothe them and see them hungry and feed them and visit them in prison and it won't be convenient to do it. It will be just as dangerous to identify with these hated Jews where they will be globally hated by every nation as it was during the Nazi time when Corey Ten Boom's family took them in to their Amsterdam um, apartment up, up in the hidden places and if you can receive this what am I doing in northern Minnesota with the temperatures of 35 below zero and we have been there for 21 years couldn't I operate from New York City or Florida or California and some comfortable place why that remote place because God spoke to me audibly and gave me the name of that place and he said End Time Teaching Center, Community Refuge. We believe with all our hearts that we are on a farm and we are a community that God has called to provide a food producing and life sustaining place. Not for ourselves only, but those who will be coming to us in flight from persecution that we might take them in. If you read Psalm 2, make a note of some of these scriptures, not to look at them now, but at some future time, and I'm saying that for the tape that is being made, because it is not only you who are being addressed tonight, but the church of the Philippines that may not again hear a word of this kind. 
I hope it doesn't sound egotistical, but I am one of the few men that are speaking this comprehensive understanding of the mystery of Israel in the last days as it pertains to the church. So there's something being recorded tonight that will affect the church in the future. And I'm often saying, if you don't understand this tonight, put the cassette up on the shelf. And events that will soon take place will make everything on that cassette more significant and meaning than you can presently understand tonight. Tonight is not a message. Tonight is the issue of life and death. Because of this speaking, individual Jews in their last day's extremity, coming through the Philippines, I know not how or why, but often the very route that I myself take in the ministry that God gives me, actually he shows me to be the flight of route and escape. So we came from Egypt. Uh, I'm sorry. It's all Egypt. Uh, we came from Japan. We began our trip in Japan. And in Japan, uh, we had some meetings with a man who televised them, who has a ministry in Vladivostok in Siberia, which is only a short hop from Japan. And so that it is conceivable that Jews would be coming, and there's a great mass of them still in the former Soviet Union, running to millions. The United States and Russia have the greatest Jewish communities yet. And that they might be driven out of even their places of security in present-day Russia, Moscow, and other places, and pushed into Siberia and by boat. Uh, however, the Lord might then bring them to Japan for Japan sifting, and then from Japan to the Philippines, and then from here to Indonesia or, or Malaysia. I don't know how or what. But I know that you're not going to be exempted, not only for the Jews' sake, but for your sake. God says, I will not do this in a corner. I will do this before the face of every nation. The tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, is the Davidic government of God. Now, why do you say Davidic art? Because God has made a covenant with King David that a seed from your loins will sit upon your throne and rule over the house of Israel forever. That's in Second Chronicles chapter 7. Don't look at it now. Write it down. Therefore, God has made a promise. A very important covenantal promise with David. That a descendant from David, who is both the seed and the... In Revelation, he's both the seed and the... Uh, Do anyone know that verse? He's both the offspring and the morning star. He both comes from David, and yet he's greater than David. Now, how can God honor a promise like that? That someone descended from David genealogically, and only one who has this qualification can be king, on the throne of David over Israel, and yet rule forever. He has to have the qualification humanly, as a son of David, but he has to have the ability to rule eternally as the son of God. And there's only one who has that qualification. Now the powers of darkness know much better what I'm talking about tonight than you. And in Psalm 2, we read, Why do the heathen rage? The heathen is the word for Nations. Why do the nations rage and the kings and the rulers take thought against God and against his anointed to break their bands asunder and God holds them in contempt and he laughs and he says, For I have declared the decree, this day have I begotten you, I have set my king on the holy hill of Zion. Now listen, children, the hour has come when we ourselves have got to be students of the Word of God. 
We ourselves need to draw out the meaning. We ourselves need to understand what is being said. What is being disclosed in this remarkable Davidic song? That the nations are hostile. They're foaming at the mouth. Because they don't want God's king on the holy hill of Zion. For when that day comes, the kings and the rulers of this earth are finished. Now if you're a real student of scripture, and you're putting questions to the text, you would say, now is God repeating himself? Why does he say, the kings and the rulers? Isn't that redundant? Isn't that an unnecessary repetition? Not at all. The kings are the human and visible magistrates over nations, but the rulers are the invisible realm of the principalities and powers of the air. And they take thought together against the Lord and against his anointed. For they will not have this man to rule over them. But God says, I have declared the decree. I have spoken it. This day thou art my son, I have begotten thee. And I have set thee on the holy hill of Zion as king. And then he says, ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. Listen, dear children. Right now, tonight, who do you think is ruling over the Philippines? Ramos? There's been an unbroken succession of manipulation and rule over this nation that goes back to the time of the Spanish exploiters and everyone who has come to put their filthy hands into this nation and to, and to extract its riches. Because greed, ambition, power, rape, lust, domination, and violence is the name of the game for the powers of darkness over every nation and over this nation. And they love it and don't want to give it up. They want to resist in every way any loss of political power. We are astonished in the United States that Marcos's wife can be in your legislature. I guess in this country, anything goes. How you allow a woman like that to be in a place of government because the powers of the air can jerk that woman like a puppet. All they have to do is get her another pair of shoes, so to speak. So what do they know that the church doesn't know? That God's government will never be established on the holy hill of Zion, which is a literal place in Jerusalem. You can visit it. I've been there. I've walked on it. It's only a hill. But it's holy because God has chosen it. And he's going to sanctify not only the people, but the land. In fact, in the end of the age, Jerusalem itself experiences convulsive earthquakes that so shift the terrestrial configuration of Israel that the whole city of Jerusalem is lifted up and above every other place in that land and maybe in the world. It will be the highest prominence in the world where today it's only a temple. So, what is the wisdom of the powers of the air? What will they do to checkmate and to keep the fulfillment of God's theocratic intention through a restored Israel? What would be the expression of their wisdom to keep themselves in the place of power and rule, to continue to manipulate, to jerk, and to possess nations? Annihilate that people whose restoration brings that David to be their king. And that explains the demonic antichrist fury that will sweep through every nation in the last days. 
because those nations will be defenseless against the uh, demonic spirits that will just spread like a fire seeing that the devil knows that he has but a short time and what defense do nations have against these powers they've been object of manipulations for as long as they have a history and if the great nation of Germany whose civilization was far more brilliant than the Philippines or even the United States and gave the world such giants of culture as Goethe, Fichte, Hegel, Nietzsche, Schopenhauer, Wagner, Mozart, and we will give. And how will the church be treated and be standing in a time when Antichrist fury sweeps the earth that hates God's people, either as the unsaved and yet unregenerate Israel or the church? We will share that persecution with them. And maybe the very reason for that is that we will identify with them and extend ourselves to them and therefore be willing to suffer their fate. And when some Jew coming out of Russia and Siberia through Japan and into the Philippines sees some brown face willing to to suffer for this Jew's sake in identification with him, though there's no natural reason why that person should extend himself and take the sacrifice and risk, they will be moved to jealousy. You know what they'll understand? There's no natural way to understand why Filipinos who have had no experience with Jews no exposure, no reason that they should be in any way disposed to them. Love them with an everlasting love, ask our concern for their well-being, and are willing to extend themselves and take them into their homes and, and, and care for them, though they know that if they're identified in court, they're finished. You know what a, you know what a thinking you will have to say? There's no way to explain this but God. If you look in Ezekiel chapter 20, from about verse 33, here's what you will read. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm, and with fury poured out, will I rule over you. And I will bring you out from the people and will gather you out of the countries wherein you are scattered with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out. That's the second time we've heard that phrase in two verses, with fury poured out. Anytime God repeats himself twice, put on your seatbelt. It's going to be an unbelievable fury for what else would require Jews from New York City or Chicago or Los Angeles or Hawaii or Vladivostok or Moscow to be uprooted from their places of security and comfort and allow themselves to be carried through places in the world that they would never have thought to travel. And the wilderness places of the world off the beaten path, not Manila necessarily, but lesser known places that are somewhat obscure like Iligan City, for example. I will bring you into the wilderness of the people, and there will I plead with you face to face. Just as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so will I plead with you, says the Lord God, and I will cause you to pass under the rod and bring you into the bond of the covenant, and I will purge out from among you rebels and then that transgress against me, I will bring them forth out of the country where they had sojourned, whether it's Russia or America or any place, but they shall not enter into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Someone asked a question the other day, how do we know that these scriptures are speaking about some past dealing of God with Israel? For it's not... Uh, um, 
once that, that they have been scattered and driven through nations. How do we know that what is being spoken here is reference to some past event that has already taken place or some future time? Here's how we know. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. No past experience of Israel in being driven through nations in, in exile has resulted in the revelation of the knowledge of the Lord that I am the Lord who has done this. And you know how they shall know? Because they will meet with him face to face in the wilderness of the nations. And I think I shared somewhere in these days, do you know why I'm saved? I saw the Lord's face in the face of a Gentile who was willing to spend some time with me, a teenage kid with whom I should have had nothing to do. She was the symbol of everything in American life that I despised. And yet there was a quality about that girl, a transparency and a, and a simplicity and, and a willingness to just spend time with this um, strange man and, and just be kind and sweet and say, why are you being kind? Oh, it's the love of God. Why aren't you afraid of me? Oh, it's the love of God. Every question I've asked, it's the love of God, it's the love of God. It, it was driving me up the wall. And then I asked my great question. I thought, if she mentions God once more, she's finished. My hobby was engaging Christians in debate and wiping them out. And she mentioned God. I said, look, sis, you're a sweet kid and all that. But you've been talking about God. How do you know that he is? Oh, she said, I know that God is. He lives in me. And boom, down I went like a felled ox. Do you know why? You say, but what was so fancy about that? That wasn't theological or intellectual or impressive. That's true. But it was unspeakably true. And she had the face to prove it. You remember when they brought the baby into the temple? And Simeon would not be allowed to die until he had seen God's Christ. And he held up that baby. And he said, the light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of the people of Israel. The light that you have, saints, especially if you're walking in the light, as he is in the light, is also at the same time the glory of the God of Israel. And we unbelieving Jews, we tough cynics, we who have resisted God and have been an enemy of the gospel for centuries, when we see the revelation of of the glory of God in the light of the face of a Gentile, we're finished. We cannot resist it. We have to say, uncle. We have to throw in the towel. We have to surrender because there's nothing more impressive to an unbelieving Jew than the revelation of the glory of their God in the face where they least expect to find it in a Gentile. A dark-skinned Gentile, a Filipino Gentile should show forth the glory of Israel's God. I will meet with you, God says, in the wilderness of the nations, face to face. And how can he be in all those places at one time? Except that your face will reveal him here. And the believers in Japan will reveal him there. And in Malaysia will reveal him there. Until after exposure after exposure, the redeemed of the Lord will return to Zion. They didn't begin that way, but they'll end that way. And everlasting joy will be upon their heads. And mourning and sighing shall flee away. How would you like the privilege of participating in God's last day stratagem by which a remnant of Israel is sifted through the nation, your nation, and gives you personal opportunity as the church in its corporate strength as community to save some of those souls out of death and out of hell and to reveal their God that they might be restored to the land as the redeemed of the Lord. That's your privilege and your soon coming opportunity. Or these scriptures don't mean what they seem to say.
and you shall know that I am is the Lord. Verse 41, I will accept you with your sweet savor when I bring you out from the people and gather you out of the countries where you, wherein you have been scattered. I will be sanctified in you before the heathen. You know what that means? God will be honored and God will be revealed through his dealings with Israel before the nations. And the nation that refuses to receive the testimony of the reality of God who has judged Israel by scattering and dispersing them through the nations and then restored a remnant of them in his mercy, that nation will be judged and will be, will be without excuse. Can you see the multiple purposes of God that is served by moving Israel through the nations? Will the true church please stand up? It will be the ones willing to extend themselves for this despised people at the risk of their life. The phony Christians, full of noise and clamor, will have no interest in this and might even find themselves opposing the Jew as being a threat to the nations and good riddance to bad rubbish. But there will be a small remnant of believers whose heart is God's heart and whose face is God's face and they will be God's saving agent against all oppression and persecution against them. I have to think hard to remember where the Lord has worked me so hard as I have been worked in these days here with you. It's as if it's the last time and you've got to get out our, these foundational truths and, and put them into the foundation of the church and get that word working because the time is short and these things are at hand. That's the only way I can explain the enormous outpouring of God and the volume of words and concepts and things that have been issuing out of us in this building from, from the day that we began until now. And I'll tell you what's so remarkable. Your ability to hear and to receive that volume of intense and complex speaking astonishes me. I don't know of an American congregation where they would sit still so long to hear things of this difficulty as you have. You know what I'd have to say? We are both of us under an unusual grace from God. And you shall know in verse 42 that I am the Lord when I shall bring you into the land of Israel, into the country for which I lifted up my hand to give it to your fathers. When I shall bring you is different than when you brought yourself. It's one thing for men to make their own political Zionist arrangements through Jewish ability, wealth, finance, and the assistance at that time of other nations. But look what the result of that return has been. Conflict with the Arabs, conflict with Palestinians, the nation itself divided almost to the point of a civil war where one Jew kills the prime minister of his own nation. You can tell the difference when God does something and when men do something. And God allows them to take a shot at it first and fail that they might know the difference when God restores them to the land supernaturally. You will know in that day that I am the Lord who has spoken and done this. And why is it so important that they should know? Because thousands of years before, God raised up one man from Ur of the Chaldees whose name was Abram, and called him and made him a promise that I will make you the father of many nations and from your loins will come a nation that will bless all the families of the earth. You guys don't know what blessing is. Jim and I were standing out in front of the motel Crystal Inn and looking out and it enjoying the landscape and Jim said 
boy, what will this look like in the millennium? What will this look like when God has really cleaned the streets and taken the junk out and the dirt and the noise and the grime and, and, and the true beauty of the Philippines shines forth both in its people and in its soil and in its nation. It will be glory unspeakable. It will be radiant and shining. And these Jews will be in every nation and shall bless all the families of the earth. And you know what God has given you? A down payment in me. That's right. You're getting a foretaste of what kind of blessing redeemed Jews will be bringing. Because they will be grafted back into their own root. How much more, Paul says, when they shall be grafted into their own root than the wild branches that have been grafted in. How much more? My first pastor, he said, I've never seen a convert like you. He said, I've never seen anybody suck up the word of God. And every sermon he says, I speak in Bible study, you take notes till your hand is limp. After six months, I stopped taking notes because I got everything that that man could, could offer. He said, I've never seen a convert grow up like you. And I, I said, really? I, I, I don't know. I'm not aware of that. You know what I have to say? It's true. When the Jew is grafted back into his own root, it's much more. But it's not much more for his sake. It's much more for your sake. I am giving you a preview of the blessing that will come to the Philippines when it will not just be a single solitary art cats going hoarse from so much speaking, but ten or a hundred or a thousand apostolic Jews filled with the glory of God and grateful for the mercy that has saved them out of death now coming and speaking into the nation and teaching righteousness and blessing in their priestly way for God made them a nation of priests and a light unto the world. When I drive down the streets of Manila and I see the advertising for the movies that you guys watch, or at least your people watch, your nation watch, there's something in my stomach that, that, that knots. I don't have to see those movies. I can just see the advertising. I know what it is. It's cheap. Lord, keep me respectable. Cheap junk. Terrible filth. Stupid, mindless, sexy, violent, fighting, explosive things, cars going up in flames and shooting in. And what vomit. I'll tell you, when my people will come into your nation in their priestly role, you'll not see films like that. They'll be jealous over the holiness of God and the sanctity of your nation and the beauty of that nation that glorifies God in holiness. They won't let you get away with cheap stuff. You'll be blessed by them. For they will perf be performing the thing for which God had in the first created them. Israel is central to the nations. I didn't invent that. And if you look at Deuteron Deuteronomy chapter 32, boy, are you ever getting a seminar tonight? And if you haven't paid up, you better pay up before you leave. I said, I went out this morning as I passed the desk. I said, has anybody asked for their money back yet? <laughs> Deuteronomy 32.8 says that when God established the bounds and the number of the nations, are you ready for this? He did so according to the number of the sons of Israel. You guys wouldn't even exist if there had not been an Israel in, by which you were to be related in proper joining in the divine order that God intends for nations. You will be sending your representatives to Jerusalem on the Feast of Tabernacles. You'll be sending your pineapples and uh, uh, what's your other good stuff? Your mangoes and, and the best and most luscious things that you have, you'll be bringing to Israel with joy. You'll pour out your riches for that nation. You'll love them because you're grateful for what they offer you. 
You'll be grateful for the law that is going forth out of Zion and the word of the Lord out of Jerusalem. You'll be grateful that the, that the restored Israel is filled with the Holy Spirit in a way that exceeds anything that we have understood, Pentecostally or charismatically speaking. They will be a people filled with the Spirit of God. You'll just want to touch the hem of their garment and you'll be blessed. There'll be such a flow of life back and forth from restored Israel to the nations and God will be supremely installed over all in the tabernacle that he has chosen in the city of Jerusalem and he will be glorified forever. And that nation that still continues to be stubborn and says, I'm not going up and who are they that I should go up to them? I was here before them and they don't have mangoes and pineapples and I'm not going. God says, I'll cut off your reign. You'll be cursed if you still insist on a stubbornness that refused to submit to my divine arrangement for nations with this nation as central to all. You know, I want to tell you, saints, and Jim can confirm this, he has never heard me speak like this before. I've spoken on this subject, but never like this, as I'm hearing myself tonight. I'm having a liberty and an unction in God like I don't know that I have ever enjoyed in speaking of this mystery. God is not speaking for entertainment. Life and death is at stake with this word tonight. If we are not prepared for the influx that will come, if we're still carnal, if we're still in the bless me club and have not become the people of God and the community of God that can bear the weight of the influx of these Jews in that condition in the suddenness and the fury in which they will break upon us, we will have missed the once and for all historic moment that comes. That's why we're speaking now as we're speaking. That's why community is not an option. Only a community of tested saints who know what it means to be imposed upon and to lose their privacy and to, and to have to bear up with the defects of saints in their immaturity and come through that will be able to sustain the impact of Jews in that day in the condition in which they will suddenly come upon you. If you get irritated with them, uh, or they don't like uh, the housing arrangement that you have provided, or learn that they can't take a hot shower, as we have learned in Crystal Inn, and start to complain, and you experience something rising up out of your gut to say, Oh, you in ungrateful people, we're extending ourselves and risking the life of our families and our children for you, and you're complaining about the lack of hot water, you ought to be grateful you have water at all. That's all you've got to do, and it's finished. I will meet with you face to face in the wilderness of the nations, and they have got to see the face of God's unconditional love. You say, but brother, we don't even have that yet for each other, let alone for Jews. And you know what the Lord would say? Exactly. That's why I'm speaking to you now. To get your act together now between yourselves. So that when they come, you're ready to show them the face of God in unconditional love that cannot be offended against. You dear saints, you precious ones, don't tell me that you, there's not a button that can be pushed where you'll show an irritation and a resentment that can flare up in a second, however much the saint that you think you are. I would be very surprised if there's not some residual thing somewhere in you that has to do with a feeling of insecurity, inferiority, that if someone makes a racial remark or, or doesn't look at you in the right way or says something of a derogatory kind, whew, what could rise up 
that you never knew you contained until you were tested. Am I telling it like it is? And I want to tell you that if Jews have served any purpose historically in their unbelief for the church, it has been to test the church. And the church has historically failed the test. Can you tell me the name of the great father of the reform of the Reformation who brilliantly laid the foundations for the breaking away from Catholicism and established what we know today as the Protestant Church who failed the test of the Jew? Martin Luther. He's a much greater saint than any of us in his brilliance, in his understanding of the faith, and his ability to set it forth, majestic. But when he was touched and probed, as we Jews say, in the kishkas, in the gut, he showed another face. You see, he naively expected that Jews who had resisted Christianity because all they saw was Catholicism would run to the Reformed the Reformation Church because there they would see their messianic faith. But a lack and a less, not one of them was impressed. He was terribly disappointed. And disappointment is the seedbed of irritation and resentment. And he had three rabbis, I think, for a number of days and he was going to persuade them about the scriptures and the messianic uh, evidence of the scriptures that shows Jesus is the Christ and the Messiah and these rabbis contended against him and for every explanation he gave they gave an alternative explanation of another kind and the man was beside himself foaming at the mouth in indignation and he finally wrote a book called The Lies of the Jews and it was one of Hitler's favorite books and gave fuel to the annihilation of Jews four centuries later. Oh, I could tell you many things, but you can believe me that when I say the church has historically failed the test of the Jew who has provoked it. Even in the earliest days of the faith, there were Jews in every community where the church is. And you know what they would say to the young church? Da, 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 da. You think that you know what you're talking about, but you don't even speak Hebrew, and you are misconstruing and misconstructing uh, these scriptures to make a case for yourself. But you guys are just a bunch of Gentile dum dums, and it's not long before God's going to restore us, because the prophets say in the last days that we will be restored and we will rule over the nations. And you know how Chrysostom, the golden mouthed orator, and one of the fathers of the church reacted with anger, irritation, and hatred. He was one of the most vicious anti-Semites, though he was a father in the church. He failed the test. And you're saying, Brother Art, are you saying that we are going to be called to a spirituality greater than Luther and Chrysostom? Yes. That's what I'm saying. You got it. That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the end of uh, careless, casual uh, pew sitting and getting by from Sunday to Sunday. You're going to have to become saints. And that's what God has wanted all along. And it's the crisis of Israel that will compel you to be it. All the wisdom of the knowledge of God. Who has been his counselor? Who has first given to him? And it shall be given again. For of him and through him and through him are all things to whom be glory forever. This is the genius of God. Not just for the sifting of Israel, but for your sifting. Because God is not satisfied with your present condition. And he knows unless you really get with it and become transcendent saints in fact, you will suffer a diminished eternity. You will have lost out in a place in God's heavenly 
administration that cannot be remedied and it will be to your eternal loss. So two things are being worked at the same time. That's why it's a mystery. Israel's restoration and the church's transfiguration by the crisis which Israel presents to the church.